I am totally delighted to be back again with Matthew. And uh, is it okay if I use your last name, Matthew? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Matt Allison. Uh, last one of the last times you were on, somebody said, "What is his name, and where can I get his book?" <laughs> it's in progress. It's in progress. Okay. Well, we're all eagerly awaiting your book for sure. Um, so Matt is a philosopher and a writer and uh, an intellect of the first order. And whenever he sends me something, I have to scurry to my dictionary. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, Matt, you told me you've been meditating on something this last week, and I wonder if you could share that with us. Yes. So I'm thinking of how to set it up. Mm -hmm. The what I want to talk about is freedom, but I want to frame it in this guise. So I belong to a community, as we all do, and our communities belong to communities. So there is that problem, if you wish to look at it that way. But to be specific now, there's Paul Vanderclay and what has aggregated and what has given, been given velocity in terms of what people are saying, how they're feeling an impetus to talk and to be seen. That has found expression in people saying this corner of the internet. So there's a recognition of place in many senses of the word, geographic only being one of them. With that said, it cries out to me that this new place deserves attention from the outside in. It's, it's being given attention from the inside out. That's the accumulation of Zoom conferences, and intellectual discussions and comment sections, et cetera. But it should also be given attention from the outside in. What is this phenomenon? And does it have historical precedent? Well, I'm going to read a little section to attune us from a book I've been studying called German Philosophy. This is by Terry Pinkard. And the subtitle is The Legacy of Idealism. And the period of history, this is very important, is 1760 to 1860. Now, the reason I'm bringing this book up is not because it's a historical survey but it's a historic, historical survey plus. And I think that plus relates to our own time as I framed it with this place, corner of the internet and what's going on from the outside in. So first things first, there's a quick concept that has to be put forward, the diachronic, which just means through time. And uh, I wrote some things down so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> um, one way to approach the diachronic, as the good doctor C.S. Lewis said, is to realize that we may contract chronological snobbery. Oh, the, those Egyptians, those pagans, those blah, blah, blah. Choose your period in history that we might feel superior to because of some reason. We have air conditioning. We have the real number line. Uh, we have uh, feminism third wave, we have all this awareness and knowledge, you know, we're, we're so conscious. And there's, there's, a, there's a certain precedent for that sort of thought. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson in, uh, who's probably the father, I'm almost done, I promise, who's almost, that it's important I set this up before I read the thing. I've Ralph Waldo Emerson, that. what? I've got all day. Okay, cool. So I'll sit back in my coffee cup, but, um, <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, I'll slow down a little bit. Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who's arguably the father of American transcendentalism, which should be held in mind as a place that critically engaged from the outside in history. Okay, so that's an instance of in macro what might be going on in micro with this corner of the internet. But we're still at the diachronic, so it's not yet emerged the problem of the diachronic. So the American transcendentalists, the, the school of thought that gave birth to people like um, Henry David Thoreau's notion of going out into the wild, of Walt Whitman's 
regard for self and the, the multitudes of selves in a self, life history, autobiography as spontaneous prose, the whole thing of leaves of grass, that, that, that comes from some place. And it comes from a certain problematizing of history. Specifically, the problematizing of history is the diachronic. So if that the through time, if we just look at history as a series of events, but we contract the illness of chronological snobbery, as C.S. Lewis and said, well, we're, we're the best thing going right now. That means we're thinking of the diachronic vertically. So Emerson said, virtue is height. That, that was part of the famous phrases of American transcendentalism. Virtue is height. And so, so when you say we're thinking of the diachronic vertically, you mean it's acting as a sort of asymptotic curve and it's, it's on the upward spike now because we're gaining so much in wisdom and blah, blah, blah. That thing Precisely. Precisely. It can be felt as that inevitability of progress. So the graph that you presented. The moral could, arc of history, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Precisely, the, um, the fall of the Western, the fall of the Roman empire was a small blip that is negligible in this asymptotic race to the top that is post enlightenment science, okay. But, and, and one justification for that in America, right, for, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's time when the colonies were being arranged, when freedom was very much in the air through the declaration, through autonomy, no longer in, under Europe's monarchy. This really was in the air, almost with a static charge of, okay, what is freedom in a history that is predetermined to progress, you see? That's, that's, the that's the teeth of the claim. Well, if it's asymptotically going up, if virtue is height, then where is my freedom? I mean, I'm a saint, I'll become a saint, put it in Christianese. So if I'm already saved through faith in the progress of heaven, the new heavens and the new earths, then what is there left for me to do in freedom? Okay, but the diachronic, is really the horizontal. Certain people have looked at history that way. Things happen indifferently. There is no asymptotic relation in the vertical. It's one thing after the other. And so it all really is succession. And this is kind of taken up in the scientific gaze, right? I could have so many things going wrong in my own life, but when I step into the laboratory, it doesn't matter. All that matters are the rules I've set up in hypothesis and the rigid performance of an experiment that may or may not even obtain outside the laboratory in reality. But the point of the enterprise is to follow these rules in abstraction or in the very narrow window of an empirical test tube or in a microscope or in a field, biology, nuclear physics, And then fights, but it's but it still runs up against this question of how how do we make a case for something beyond the diachronic? One thing happens after the other indifferently, and not fall prey to the asymptotic virtuous height, which doesn't leave any room for individual autonomous action from you or me. And when you when you ponder that, it really does actually become an ethical problem of the self. Okay. I'm gonna say it sounds like you need a different measuring stick. If the measuring stick is that, that virtue is height, then um, it puts me in mind of a, a graph that I saw on Twitter today. Somebody had gone back over the last 200 years of drought in the UK. And because there must be a lot of talk going on right now, there's probably a drought in the UK right now and everybody's talking about it. It's probably unprecedented, right? They're always saying this is unprecedented. It's a result of this or that other thing. But they had gone back over the last 200 years of drought <clears throat> or maybe 2000, I don't know, however long they have records. 
And there's ups and downs, ups and downs, and there's absolutely no trend. There's there's bad droughts, and then there's pretty good years, and then bad years and good years, and you know, so it's across this whole span, there's no trend visible. And that's probably what history looks like because as much as we don't want to acknowledge it, the measuring stick is sort of sin, <laughs> right? Because- um, Especially, just a quick remark to what you had said, especially when one defines sin as missing the mark, mm -hmm. missing the trend, not in the sense of the trend not being visible. Of course, it's missed. It's emotively missed as absence. So yes. So expand on that a little bit. That's interesting. I will, but in the course of our conversation, because I want to hear where you were going with next. So that's that's a little definition floating in the air of sin, but keep going. Well, I may not have been going anywhere else next, but I was thinking about the when you were talking about the problematizing of history through time. Mm. Because um, before we got online, you had sent me an email about uh, therapeutic um, participation, not therapeutic, authentic participation. And, and, and you used the word propedeutic to, um, to set that up. And so I had to look up propedeutic to understand what it was. I had never seen that word before and I couldn't take it apart Latinizing it. <laughs> but, um, but the idea of the propedeutic is that and maybe you could say it better, but I'll just say what I got off, off the internet. Please. The idea of the propedeutic is that which we learn that prepares us to learn more. So it's basically in your first year of college, you get your general ed courses, you get the, the foundational framework of all the different subjects, and then you can pursue one subject and go deeper. But you, you, you have Maybe in science, now you have the capacity to observe and measure things, and then you can dig deeper. Or in history, you have a general scope of what has happened in history, and then you can dig deeper. But you need that propedeutic in order to prepare you for the moment, right? And um, when you talk about the problematizing of history through time, that we, we get into this idea of chronological snobbery, it's because propedeutic in one sense doesn't give us enough information about any given moment in time mm. to, to go deep enough to understand the complexities of their inside, right? Because they had an inside just the way we have an inside. Our inside consists of all of our technology, but that doesn't make us intrinsically any more capable of dealing with life or of dealing with actual circumstances um you know in, in a, a, a simple cheap kind of an example would be uh, marcus aurelius the meditations are still being read and used by people today because he lived a life he didn't just think about things he was responsible and he had to make decisions and he lived a life and he wrote and he and, and it's been preserved all these thousands of years for a reason because he understood something about what it meant to authentically participate in life. So and, and yet, and yet I still don't see the authentic participation yet. I see it still in question. So the on the one hand, the propedeutic. I love the way you set it up as far as the moments. Pre preparation for the moments, and I'll add preparation for the moments in the self and individual, which I won't bother to define right now. I want to keep them somewhat vague. But we'll, let's, let's color it and give it the character of Marcus Aurelius, since you brought it up. Because Marcus Aurelius obviously had a life that is available to public consumption via his book. All right, so great example. We'll put him right here. But with the propedeutic on the one hand, the teaching before, there's also the prolegomenon. And that just means the word said before. So in the middle, lego from logos, 
like Legos, people build up Legos, build up structures, build up teachings, build up coordinates. So this, you have to have a blueprint in order, order to make a skyscraper, but you must have a vernacular and a vocabulary in order to have a conversation, even to have a monologue with self. This is what poetry, lyric poetry teaches us. In order to have a conversation, even with yourself, you must have a vocabulary prior to that you can engage with and in, and maybe out of that internally build out through discovery. So the prolegomenon, the words before, and in some vague sense, the structure before, comes, I would say, first on the way to any, uh, any future authentic participation. Any future authentic participation. And in this corner of the internet, with an exemplar being Jonathan Peugeot, that word often is introduced in conversation, participation. But often it is introduced as a given. But I don't think we should treat it as a given, or we should treat it at first as a given. But diachronically, it can be argued every single individual in every single era has participated in something. And if the phenomenon exists everywhere at all times, it exists nowhere, right? There's nothing special about it if it is everything. And so any future participation, I would say, is still in question. Otherwise, it disappears in, in the all. Well, I'm going to throw something in here because I'm not exactly sure where you're going with this or what you mean when you use the word participation. But um, a random thought came to me about when my, my uh, youngest daughter was born. And I'm in the delivery room and I, I, the doctor said to me, while he was delivering her, he said, do you realize that every child brought into this world will affect world history? Mm -hmm. And I contemplated that for a long time because it's radically true. Even what the, the world would say is the most insignificant life affects world history. I mean, what we know of chaos theory that that a butterfly flapping its wings in Argentina can result in a tornado someplace else. So, you know, I mean, um, a person crossing the street at any given time could affect someone else's trajectory of where they're going and when they end up there. And it's going to affect world history. Um, if, I mean, and it's simple when, you, the, the cheap way out is to use Hitler, but he's just one individual. And if, he, if his art professor had liked his art better and had allowed him into art school, that one person who may have been just an insignificant art teacher someplace affected world history in the most grievous of ways, completely unknown to him that it was going to end up killing millions of people. And not only killing millions of people, but distorting the way that we look at things even today so that that becomes the thing against which we fight at all costs, even to our detriment today. So One quick thing on that as a, as a notation from earlier, we see in what you just described also the re repetition of the problem of freedom in an asymptotic future. We might say the future is nothing but progress, but we might say the future is fill in the blank. As long as it is predetermined, right now we, we're talking about the possibility of it being predetermined in a scatter plot fashion of chaos, but even that is a predetermination. And in that predetermination, it begs the question still of in a predetermined sequence, where does any action become meaningful in itself? 
Well, now, wait a minute. What makes you presume that everything is predetermined? Predetermined in the sense of we can tell its story. And in that story, even if we don't have the details, we have the plot or we have the genre. In other words, we have its circumference. So the first thing we talked about was the asymptotic. Well, that's a frame, which while not giving the details, gives the limits. And that enclosure is not only a remark, but operates as the definition of freedom, where the game is played. The next thing we talked about, the scatter plotting of every single individual being a world changer for good or ill, is also, even though it's in a wider frame, also tells a story that that thing that at the end of the story is a consequence of the beginning. That, that sounds like fate. And that fate, while it doesn't eliminate freedom, to my mind begs the question of how we can get, even in that scatter plot view, any meaningful responsibility out of individual actions. Well, okay, you're, you're laying out something that, um, and I don't know if you're doing this just to be a devil's advocate. <laughs> you're trying to force me into telling my story. Um, oh. <laughs> so, um, I think the one given is sin. So the consequence of, of the fall, the consequence of the choice to um, adhere to lies rather than adhering to the truth, that consequence resulted in sin and this propensity to live in lies rather than living in the truth. Um, so, so that One quick thing to that, can I, can I understand as you're using the word sin, to go back to the earlier chapters of our dialogue here, the invisible, because as you made the scatter plot, as the as you made the plot of ups and downs in in a certain sequence of time, the sin would be the missing the mark. In other words, the invisible, not being able to give the trend. Or are you using sin in this analogy uh, with a different definition? Because I'm hearing as you're describing that, if, if we turn from the truth towards a lie, we're in the invisible, the not visible sin. Well, let me step back a little bit and mm -hmm. fill in some holes here. The Lord Jesus Christ says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The, that word, the truth, is actually the same word as reality. Right? At least, yeah. 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 So, so the Lord Jesus Christ not only exemplifies what it means to be one with God, but, but he is reality itself. He is reality. So, so when we draw close to him, which I think always works asymptotically because there's no way to, to reach his perfection, but, but we're always, as we draw close to him, he's always drawing us up with him. So he's always drawing us up with him. Mm. But <clears throat> when, when I err, when I miss the mark, mm. whether it's on purpose or involuntarily or unknowingly, I experience consequences because I am not lined up with reality because consequences come, you know, people always say, oh, reality hit me up the head with a two by four, <laughs> but that's not really quite right. Yeah. That the, the, the being awakened by the two by four was an act of love because if that act of love does not occur, I continue to go down that wrong road and ultimately will experience devastating consequences. So that 
drawing close to reality and then failing and, and falling away bears consequences in my life, in mm. anybody's life, you know? Airplanes fall from the sky, uh, cars crash, people die, people hurt each other because we have not aligned with the ultimate good. So, so, so when, the, I, when I say sin, it's not aligning with the ultimate good. Missing. Being lost, being lost then. The, that's, that's amazing. So what I noticed that we've done, and it, align, it aligns with what I was, where I was going next to get out of the diachronic, to the synchronic, which is not S-I-N, but S-Y-N, to measure together, the together time, the together time, time together, is, is, is what you braided with that. So notice, and often I think this is a presumption of secularity. History is a grand stage with some furniture and some light in spots, but most of it is up for grabs and has not been given warmth yet, mm. or even sufficient darkness to make it interesting. Okay. And that presumption of the future as this scatter plot where we all play some vague part that we're not aware of yet, and we have to also decide on our own to do it, but we have to come at that deciding of how we're going to do it through concepts and ideas that are mediated by prior and past societies that also are still with us and will probably outlive us. This engages with the future as a person to a person. In other words, we might say the future is neutral to our hopes and dreams, mm -hmm. but to do a Petersonian, we don't act as if the future is neutral to our hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. We treat it as a person would a person. And what I mean by person is a bit abstract. So in the Latin, persona means to sound through. So a flute is a person, <laughs> right? It sounds through, it functions. It, it, it is an instrument. A person is an instrument. We don't like to hear that because we have certain connotations for a person. A person is in some circles defined as human being and human being is defined as a self-evident free creature in the eyes of God with infinite value. And so we don't like to hear that a person is an instrument. But if we take away the bias of self-evident free creatures in the eyes of God with infinite value, value and look at person as an instrument, a, a flute, we can see it as an expression. So uh, to see, and, and this operates in stereotypes. So when we think of a painter, what person are we thinking of? Are we thinking of Joe who loves surrealist art two blocks away? Most people probably aren't so specific. They don't have that rigid designation. What they have is a vague painting of someone, probably gender neutral, maybe a little more man than woman, maybe, maybe not. The association doesn't matter too much, but they have the idea, the vision in their mind of someone probably with some kind of object, and on that object, certain choices. To make it really concrete in English, they might envision someone with their thumb through the hole of an easel and multiple colors in an arc of some kind or in some kind of pattern around. This presents the person that we see when we think the idea painter. But that is no different than the expression of sound coming through the wind in a flute. Both are expressions or the underlying being, the thing that is of infinite value. But the expressions are not of infinite value, unless we want to say the expression of the infinite is itself infinite, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay, hold on. So when, you, when you're using the analogy of the flute and you're saying the flute itself is the expression, 
the air moving through the flute is the, the um, I hesitate to use this word, individuality, because I've been hit a few times in the comments recently on the difference between individual and person. And I'm not sure why it matters so much, but we, we need some <laughs> sort of a word. We need some sort of a word that describes what differentiates one individual, one person from another person. And I, I so I agree. think this idea of a flute is a is a perfect illustration. If the if the flute is an expression, every flute has a different intonation. Mm, great word, intonation. So yes. When 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 the flautist plays, well, so there's two things happening there. The the way that the flautist plays, their embouchure, the, the the force with which they expel the air across the flute differs. And the way the flute is carved out inside and what kind of material it's made of. And I would venture to guess that even mechanically produced flutes still have very slight differentiation in their vibrations that they produce because even mechanically produced things cannot be exactly the same inside. So when the air moves across it, you're going to get very slight differentiations in sound. Mm. So, so I don't buy the idea that just because and I might be misreading you, but I think what you're saying is that because we all have the same telos, that therefore we don't have true freedom. And if there's no true freedom, then how can we have meaning? So I'm not making the assertion we have no true freedom, but I want to notice that at this point, I have not arrived at the concept that would allow me to authentically inhabit the thinking of a free person. Right now, what I have in concept is either a scatter plot of everyone is an, in, I, I'm sorry to say it this way, is a unique snowflake, right? Is, is completely idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And that is isomorphic to infinite value because it can go an infinite number of ways. And while my heart agrees with that, I would never deny anyone their infinite relation to infinity. It does present the same problem of, well, then how does any of your actions have real weight if it's one of an infinite series of possible actions you could have taken and maybe given the time to take? Versus, well, we're all in the same boat to perfection. Well, in that second case, if we're all in the same boat to perfection, then it really doesn't matter what I do now or in the next instant or in the instant after that. And matter here is as you presented the flute, it might produce a different sound, but if the telos of the expression is the same, then how, what, then, then how does it matter on the way? How does it matter on the way? And then you brought, so then you brought up Jesus. And I think this was the beautiful transition you brought up. How does it matter on the way? So if we think of the flute again, and as, what was that word that began with an A? I've never heard that word before. As, as differential forces applied from the flautist. What was that word, A? Embouchure. It's not A, it's E. Oh, okay. E M B O U C H U R E, I believe, embouchure. And and what what is that technically? So it's the way that the mouth is held. So like, if you're playing a clarinet, your mouth is held like this. <laughs> if you're playing a flute, your mouth is held like. So it's the shape of your mouth, the shape that your mouth takes when you're playing an instrument. So that also I could. A different embouchure. Embouchure. So embouchure could also be the expression for a person. Different embouchures are different persons. No, it's one individual. It's one individual with different embouchures, one individual with different personalities, to put it in the vulgar sense of today, right? Oh, I have a narcissistic personality. Person could be much more descriptive than that. An embouchure, I would say, is more descriptive of a person because you can actually point to an exhaustive description of its trait the position of the lips versus some 
very vague notion of a narcissist. Okay, but with that little aside, with the embouchure as starting point, as the, as the wind by force is moving all on its way between the holes to the end, but also outside to the end, as it's moving down, as it is mattering on the way, that is where human life finds itself, right? That is where we find ourselves presently. We're not at the telos, but we're not at the beginning. Um, the embouchure of my existence was being born. And, and just like someone could train their embouchure, um, I, there's a certain determination that, like you can't just play any certain way, you have to play with a series of embouchures. So too, I was born human from a woman. So there's some kind of symbolic description there. But anyway, I don't, I don't even know how to go into that. But it, what I'm trying to say is all along the way, we find ourselves mattering. Now in history, if, to go back to that post-enlightenment idea, if history is seen as a neutral given where the stage is mostly dark, there's some furniture, but not the warmth of a drama, because that's where we come in, there's this presumption of freedom that, well, I could burn a couch on stage like an absurdist, or I can do a very straight-laced interpretation of pride and prejudice. Both of those kind of seem arbitrary choices because they're one of infinite possibilities. And that, I think, is where a lot of atheist materialists find themselves bored with the notion of history and the dry bill of goods they're given as their freedom. Okay, they're like, well, this journey doesn't really matter. I'm on it, but I don't really care to even come to the Talos. Well, see, I don't like this that's enclosure. The, that's the problem with boundaries right there, because if you have an infinite number of possibilities and you have no boundaries, then you have absolutely no, there can't be any, there cannot intrinsically be any creativity because there's no boundaries. And that's why they're bored. Yes. So, so there have to be uh, boundaries. And I, I know you remember Jordan Peterson talking about this, that when you're faced with this infinite field of possibilities, the postmodernist says, well, there's no way to make yourself, make your way across the field because there's no way to make a choice. There's infinite and, and then, number of possibilities. Yes. So we've arrived at choice, which is very, very, I'm glad we arrived here. So that in the mattering along the way, there is an exhibition of choice. And that choice is embodied. And if you wanna talk about telosis or telai, however you wish to use the plural form of telos along the way, like milestones along the way, uh, beats in a script along the way, as we're moving in our own tunnel vision, there comes milestones where we think, oh, I have made a decision. I am now in the present of the consequence of my decision. I am in college. I had applied. I was accepted. And now here I am. This is a phenomenon everyone experiences. Then we have to come to a sense of where we can tap ourselves on our own shoulder and love the fact that we are mattering along the way. And that is not an easy step to take in media race, in the middle of things, to be okay and content in the field as the one walking embodying choice in the field. That is a hard problem of self-regard. And I think this is where the verse that you brought up in John matters. If history is a neutral something, it's very much like a wall a vision board that we can put up our hopes and dreams on, but that board will never talk to us. It will never long for our arrival and we know it. And that produces a work ethic, but not a love ethic. It doesn't engage our deep longings. It merely engages our mechanical abilities to matter along the way. Therefore, as, as we outlined with the embouchures, 
And I'm sorry, I mispronounced it. And as we outlined with the um, person of the painter, these stereotypes that come to mind, the stereotypes are persons that carry with them the promise of satisfaction. So the person of the mother is not a neutral image. And it certainly is not an image that merely serves as a goal for mechanical action. It carries with it the promise of embrace, warmth, and unconditional love, regard, enclosure of a, of a new kind of freedom that is a sort of creative, right? It has production. It, it has the regard for its production, mother and child. Okay, so we, we, we see that the future, far from being a wall as a vision board with the atheist materialists, when we're operating at a higher level, we want to see the future as a person. Now, I don't know which of the possible persons we could see it as. I don't know where the necessity for the choice of the particular person comes in, but at least in general outline, we see that it is far better to see the future as person than as neutral stage, which requires our engagement. And this gets us past post-enlightenment science to now what Jesus did in that verse, which is so amazing. He said, the I am, the ego and me, the being of God, the bush talking to Moses said, I am. The being beyond the particular persons, right? A, a bush should not catch flame. That defies the law of the person of the leaf of the bush. It also defies the properties of the flame. The two are somehow syncopated. They're brought together. They matter together. They are synoptic. So too, Jesus said, I am the aletha, the reality, which includes the future. So he's making the future a person, a person that carries with it, like the mother and child, certain promises of fulfillment, of longings. And also he says that he is the way, the dia, logos, the measure, the steps, the choices in the field. And to allow for that paradoxical synoptic, to see that as synoptic, not as diachronic. He's not saying the world is where I am out there, go find me. If that was the case, we would hate ourselves now to find ourselves then, right? It wouldn't give us what to do now. But if he says, I am the reality and I am the way, it makes the matter along the way as important as the telos. In ethics, we would say it makes the means as significant as the end. And this, this, this is incredibly sophisticated because it does with metaphor, the things we tend not to find to be clean, right? It says that on the one hand, the future is a person. And on the other hand, the road is a person. Well, I walk on the road. I can't walk on a person. But as we just brought out, you, we can use stereotypes as persons. We can also use the shape of a lip as a person because both are referring to certain teloses outside their representation or expression. The image of a painter stands for the telos of painting, which presumably is the artifacts. The telos of the position of the lips at the flute is presumably the composition, the sound at the end. Well, and uh, yeah, and, and, and so Christianity makes of that being makes of that, and here I think is the most important word I've said so far, makes of that presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. Mm -hmm. be before we go forward, I want to just loop back a little bit to that word propedeutic, because um, 
the that relationship with the flute the the embouchure is what creates the relationship with the flute and when the embouchure is the first thing you teach of a, a, a wind instrument player i've never played a flute but i but i have played clarinet and saxophone but the first thing they teach you is the embouchure because that creates your relationship with the instrument and you can't go deeper with that instrument until you have that relationship. So in that sense, the propedeutic is what sets up the relationship. The propedeutic is that, that initial set of, um, not standards, but in some sense, uh, measurable tools that you can use or um, just the broad scope of of knowledge that you need to enter in deeper into anything. Well, so the embouchure is that with a wind instrument, you have to have that relationship. And, and, I, and I just wanna tell this little story about my daughter when she was four years old. Please. She did something naughty. I don't remember what it was. She knew what she had done. She did it on purpose. I think we had some people over to dinner or something and she was feeling like she wasn't the center of attention anymore. So she did something <laughs> to get attention. And I asked her to come over so that I could talk to her very calmly. And, and I had been reading all these books about eye contact and how important it is that your eye contact for your child is always eye contact of love. Mm. You, might, you might use a stern voice, but your eye contact needed to always be an eye contact of love. Never use eye contact as a way to cast shade on a kid or to make them feel stupid or, you know, you don't use eye contact that way. And I think there's very good reason for that and which will show up in the story. So she comes over and, she, her, and she's downcast, right? And I'm trying to get her to look at me so she can see the love because I want her to know that even though she did something naughty, I forgive her and I love her because she knew she had done something. She, you could see it. I mean, she's all hunched over and her head is down like this, but that's the way we are with Christ. When we sin, when we err, particularly when we do it on purpose, we can't make eye contact. No, and, one, and, one quick thing. Notice how beautifully pregnant that little preposition was given what we had said before, especially when we do something on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's great with the idea of the telos mattering along the way, being stuck in history, blah, blah, blah. Keep going, please. Okay, so, so she can't make eye contact with me, and I'm that way with the Lord. I can't make eye contact with him. Part of that is I feel the guilt. Part of that is I don't think how could he possibly love me. Part of that, you know, but what it's doing is, He's not the one that's cutting off the intimacy. I'm the one that's cutting off the intimacy because I won't look, I won't see, I won't look into his eyes. And you know, that word see, we've had email con conversations about that as well. That um, in John chapter eight, 56 through 58, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees or the crowd or something. And he says, you don't know God, but I do know him. And, and I looked that up because I thought he's using no twice there. Is it the same word in the Greek? Well, the first no, you don't know him, is the gnosis no, the experiential knowing. The second no is the, is the I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but eido, I think. And it has the meaning of see in the sense, not only of visually seeing, but the aha moment, I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. It has euphoria with it. I didn't know that. Yeah, the apprehension moment. I see. Mm. And so Jesus has that relationship with the Father. He sees him. He he sees him. He knows him. It's this, it's a a deep, alert, intentional, intimate knowing. And um and it's it's a it, it's a knowing that raptures. Previously, you and I had a conversation somewhere in, in your channel 
talking about the piece of painting that can rapture, enrapture the viewer and, and lift. It has this principle of lift off. And so it's not only that Jesus sees and says, yes, this is the father and absolute knowledge I know, but it is, he finds himself out of his mind. Like we literally do it, right? Our eyes go up to the, to the eyebrow and sometimes someone will point their finger up and the head will move. They make a movement, a gesture out of their mind as if they were amazed but it's not an amazement of madness, frenzy, but it is the amazement of the preconditioned apprehended. Oh, because it's not only, oh, I see, but if it's, if it's to go beyond that violent initial, it must also be cared for. And it is cared for in then saying the second movement, I see, of course, or I see, and what underwrites the of course, I see and I affirm. Well, so yes. And what I what I what I was seeing also is that in that when when I come to a recognition of some deep truth and I have that, I see, I see, you know, I see, it's like a finally, I see, you know, I finally, I, precisely as Adam saw Eve, finally, bone of my bone. Right. Yes. I, I get it. Well, what's happening at that moment in me is that inside of me, because of everything that I've ever learned and experienced and everything, there's there's all sorts of little feelers out there inside of me. They're just looking to connect with something. And when that I see moment comes, that whatever it is that I see has now not only illuminated me, but it has attached to all of those things and added mm -hmm. onto who I am. And it has filled me and become one with me. And that is the sense in which I think Jesus is saying, I see, I apprehend the father, the father and I are one. It's that moment of oneness. And that is the outworking of love. Now, I, I wanna read to you a little thing on the, the word hope, if I can find it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that verse in Hebrews, faith <clears throat> is the substance of things hoped for. Um, so one of the things that I wrote is like, hope is the vision or the tangible potential. I was trying to get, put this into words, you know, faith is the acted out part hope that is acted upon with faith becomes reality. And then I looked up, um, I was looking up the word hope in the Greek dictionary, and it was describing hope as actively waiting for God's fulfillment for the faith he has in birth through the power of his love. Mm, actively waiting. So the faith is in birth and the faith is all these little attachments waiting to be attached. And um, when, when the thing hoped for arrives, then that faith is manifested. Faith gains substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So this combination of faith and hope actually results in reality. It results in matter, materialization or manifestation or... Construction. Construction, but yes, yes. We like to say social constructivists, but what about the love? What a, here love constructs. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I looked up the etymology of the word construct. It actually goes very, 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 very far back to the Anglo-Germanic, something like this, when people didn't write anything down, but they merely breathed out syllables. It comes from the word from. And from comes the, from the word, which who knows how to pronounce it anymore. It's like a word in the Torah. Uh, where, do the, where do the vowels go? From comes from the word F-R-O, which literally was probably used in reference to where to put the logs for your homestead. As you were cutting trees from the infinite, 
and you were bringing them to a place, you had to decide where to place them in this place for home. And that homestead, that dwelling place was a construction out of what? Desire, desire to dwell with, with what? Well, if it's with the cosmos, you didn't need to construct anything. You were in the construction. It was the desire to dwell with others. And we could work out family here and, and such things. So construction, it was never without these heartwarming things you describe. Looking at history post-enlightenment as a neutral given might try to sands and scrub away the deep affection, the gazing intentional intimacy of structure. And so when you were describing that, it made me realize, oh, so earlier we were talking about the problem of freedom in a scatter plot history or in a predetermined asymptotic virtuous height perfectionism. And I think in certain orthodox circles, we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, we'll be, we're on the way to theosis. So nothing now matters. I might, I might as well live on a hill by myself waiting to die. So the interpretation of the act of waiting is one of immense negation because like the philosopher, you wonder how can there be any responsible activity here on earth in these moments that are already predetermined to end up in theosis. With that said, the American route of the Declaration of Independence, which says we are all self-evidently created by God and therefore endowed with inalienable rights, frees us from arbitrary power, but it puts power in an arbitrary position, namely in the invisible of our own subjectivity. And that this has been being worked out in America ever since the idea was conceived, right? Wars, factions, religions being brought in as this is the truth. How is it the truth? Because I experienced it. And I am self-evidently free to experience. Therefore, it's as if you can put at the end of any kind of non sequitur, any kind of word salad, the therefore I experienced it. And I am infinitely subjective as created by the infinite for recognition of the infinite, to have a gaze on the infinite. And therefore it's true. This is from the Declaration of Independence, really. Um, but the American transcendentalists came in and problematized it. When, when, when Ralph Waldo Emerson said virtue is height, he wasn't saying that's true. He said, that's how we see it. <laughs> and the problem is the virtue isn't that mountain over there. We could put a train track through it and become industrialists. The problem is we don't know where to, inter where to begin interrogating our own subjectivity to find what makes us worthy. And so the self-esteem movement, blah, blah, blah. But now I think with all the transgenderism and all the, all the little, all the echo chambers of people deciding, and I don't think it's bad, but saying there hasn't been represent, representation of X or Y or Z. I think that is a normal outworking of the problem of subjectivity, which is really a problem of where to locate the meaning of our freedom. So then along okay, the lines so, of this map. You, you, you just walked right into it. <laughs> To locate the meaning of our freedom, yes. I look intently into the the you know the liberty of the law. Okay. What is that verb? What is that verse? Oh, with Paul. Okay. Uh, it's in Corinthians. Therefore, I look intently into the law of perfect freedom. Oh my goodness. Okay. No, we'll, I, I, we we'll got find to find it because we'll, I'm not quoting it correctly. But okay. but before you know, before I lose my train of thought. Yes. Um, the, the error, if I dare say, is the focus because now I don't know what, I haven't read enough about the transcendentalists to know why they used, I don't know if they were describing themselves as transcendentalists or someone else put that label on them, 
if it meant what I would like it to mean, then their focus was on the highest and ultimate good. Their focus was on God, not on themselves. Because if we put, the problem with subjectivity is if my focus is on myself, then uh, my, either, either I stumble through pride or I stumble through shame because it's always me. I'm good enough or I'm not good enough, but I'm not the focus. Jesus is the focus. So remember, oh no, I don't want to cut focus. you off before that Keep thought. your eyes mm -hmm. on Jesus, right? Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm going to find that verse. Okay, excellent. So with what you, with what you just said, it popped in my mind what you said earlier, namely the story of every human being born is a potential world changer. Mm -hmm. that's, an that's an incredibly burdensome epithet to place on anyone's forehead or shoulders, but here it's distributed across all. How do we escape from such a rock that it is the good pleasure of people who try to build up our ego to crush us with. Remember that part in Isaiah? It pleased him, it pleased the father or the king to crush him like a grain, to crush him under the rock. For America, and I just say America as a stand-in, to tell us that we are burdened with the infinite freedom to change the world, we are crushed under that weight. And so we don't move at all. How could we? We do not have the resources. So it is argued. So what we must do is what we must externalize that burden. And as Jordan, remember Jordan Peterson said, the ancients looked at the sky and populated it with gods. And the population of the gods in the sky was really the manifestation of their own subjective imagination presenting itself to them as an object for consideration. To, as it were, cut from the sky, the rock of civilization, and bring it down as rule of law, blah, blah, blah. This sort of justification also finds itself in the guilt of having a conscience that we are responsible for our actions. And so that externalization can go a number of different ways. One way it can go, I think inevitably it goes to not the future as a neutral thing that we must engage with, but the future as a history. So that immense burden we have, we externalize to the stereotype, the person at the end of history, the telos that we're mattering along to. And then we start to give it a story. Now, if we've been traumatized, we might see that person as decadent. Oh, God is just out to get me. Whatever story, that's, that's engaging with the stereotype. It's telling a story of history, of my own significance. We cannot escape this. The transcendentalist wanted to say we cannot escape this. And so how do we find, how do we find alertness on the way? And I think this is, not, this is a movement that came well before the Declaration of Independence. It happened in the construction of Germany. <laughs> and the place given, the foremost place given to Kant's critique of pure reason. Because in 1760 to 1860, along the time we discovered how freedom could be tied with self-evident truth, self-evident truth of our own consciousness. So well before the phenomenology of here I am in a field with infinite choice, people found themselves in a colony with an ocean separating themselves from the king. Still the same question of, well, what do I do now? The very same question faced America in its beginning. The very same question faced Germany before it was a country. You had a bunch of people who were told what to do by various factions, various kings. They were serfs to feudal lords who had their own whims and their own separate bureaucracies. And universities were set up merely so that some people could go from the farm to standing in attendance before the prince or king of their local district and saying the things saying the state of the science that would make that king look upon them favorably. This was peer review back then, okay? I know it has had its changes, but it was peer review back then. Definitely peer review. It mattered for how you saw Aletheia, your relationship to your future self, okay? In that, people were 
beginning to see, as this author Terry Pinkard claims, that the world was kind of slipshod. I mean, there were all these different kings and principalities and lords, and they didn't agree with one another. And here I am planting my potatoes. This doesn't feel right. I shouldn't be planting my potatoes like it's a normal day and I'm an everyday creature when there's this chaos out there. Nobody can agree on anything about freedom, truth, beauty, love, but I'm expected to plant my potatoes. I, I can't live this way with a dual consciousness. And you can't point to some part in the forest where the river or the stream bubbles out and say, that's where the dual consciousness is. It was not in objectivity, it was in subjectivity. It wasn't in any one of the theories of some bureaucrat in one of the castles. It was happening to someone planting a potato and by extension, all of us. But it wasn't given, and here's the, here's the movement of what we said before, but that dual consciousness wasn't given expression. It wasn't given a person. It didn't have an embashar. It had its embashar because they were feeling it. It had, in other words, they were in relation to something, but they didn't know what its telos was. Everything out there is divided. I'm divided inside with my dual consciousness. How can we speak of a telos? But yet here I am in relation to. So their lips were on and they were mattering along but no one could agree on the telos. In other words, no one could see the same person. No one could see the same person. This gave energy to the philosophy back then, that dual consciousness. So philosophy back then is not philosophy now. Philosophy now is not philosophy in Socrates' era. It was a quirk of history at that moment that philosophy was given the energy of this dual consciousness. And so now I want to read this paragraph of the historian surveying the time and Kant's relation to it, a critique of the crisis. And I think we'll hear in it echoes of our time and especially echoes in this corner of the internet. In the aftermath of the revolution, what happened was unprecedented. Philosophy suddenly became the key rallying point for an entire generation of German intellectuals, all of whom had begun reading Kant's works as they gradually appeared in the 1780s and 1790s, not just as academic treatises, but as harbingers of a new order. The explosive combination of Kantian critical philosophy and political revolution interpreted through the German experience of the Reformation as having reformed the church while leaving the corruption of society woefully intact, gave a new impetus to thinking about a reconciliation within the dual consciousness that educated Germans carried around with them. This hit particularly hard on the new generation that was coming of age just as Kant's works were being published for the first time. The revolution inspired a whole set of those young men and women to imagine very different lives for themselves and to hope for a new world and for new political, moral, and religious order to be realized within their own lifetimes. They experienced the conjoined events of the new philosophy and the revolutionary upheaval, not simply as political or social events, but as signaling a new epoch. And that's what I meant earlier by saying, we gotta get out of the diachronic into, into the synoptic. The difference between history repeating itself the idea of just something new out of the corridor and into an epoch, where epoch is the meeting of the subjective and the objective, a meeting of their dual consciousness, finding expression in a new person and the new person coming to light transports history. 
So, so you're you're making that claim that an epoch has a personality. Yes. And and, and, and the and the personality comes from within the struggle of the precedented of the person planting the potato and having those aberrant thoughts of, I don't know where the telos is anymore. <laughs> Out of this struggle grows the consciousness that, that gives way from within to the new personality, the new history, the new engagement, the telos that was already there, but is now properly posited as outside the self that the self can gaze upon, can finally match eyes with, match eyes with. That visibility now, it connects with what you said about the mother and the child. And it also connects strangely with John 3.16. Mm -hmm. Especially as you use the second type of knowing of seeing, of the eureka. I think that notion of eureka, of seeing, of the moment, of the epiphany, finds an additional concept in John 3.16 for God, that we should explore. Because for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed on him, which probably is the word for trust, that whoever trusted him should have eternal life should never perish and have eternal life so um the other word i was looking up the other day is the the greek word bebios bios Be bebios oh Be bebios apparently it means secure mm. but it but it also you know you were talking earlier about the road underfoot so secure is also um, a place that you can stand on, right? So I, I thought that was interesting because, well, first of all, with quantum mechanics, it's all in motion. And the only thing that makes it something that we can stand on is whatever is inside the universe that's making these things hold together so that we can stand on it and so that it's solid for us. But then that word substance, which is related to the idea of hope or hope, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance is the same word as hypostasis. Mm. Even just if you take it apart in the Latin, substance, standing under. So with security, we're standing on. And with substance, we're standing mm -hmm. under. And the other picture I love about that is that when I was in Japan learning Chinese characters, because that's how they write in Japan, some of the Chinese characters have buried inside of them very, very deep truths. Ooh. And this was discovered by the, the first missionaries to China back in the 1800s who went over there and learned the language and then used the language to teach the gospel to the Chinese people. And the, the Chinese character for righteousness is a character where the, the made up of two halves, a top half and a bottom half inside the square. The bottom half is the character for me. The top half is the character for lamb. So it's wow. lamb over me me standing under the lamb this was this was prior to the missionaries coming on the scene yes, thousands of years old so this is why i say that that at the tower of babel everyone had an inherent understanding of who god is but then when they were divided and their languages were divided and they moved out across the face of the earth that truth that they took with them got covered up and twisted and corrupted a little bit here and there, but they still had pieces of the truth. So that's why I think the truth shows up in all sorts of religions around the world and uh, shows up in languages, shows up in, you know, 
it just shows up everywhere. Old wives tales, there are bits of truth buried all around that, that we can uncover. And then when they line up with, with God's truth in the word, we know, yes, that, that's truth, that's reality. Right? There's, there's a repetition of the concept you put forward earlier of the alignment, the alignment making visible the alignment making visible in activity, searing it with energy. And here's what I mean by searing it with energy. It happens that today is a Monday and two days ago was the Pentecost for Eastern Orthodox Christians. Mm -hmm. And so I ducked in and heard the priest say an understanding of Pentecost, which means 50th. And I think it, I think it stands for the 50th day after Pascha, after the resurrection. And he was talking to children, right? He had priests, he, he sat down I in front of us all and he asked the children to come up and the children sat. And I was, I happened to find myself behind my professor of the novel in this course. I hadn't seen him for years, but there I was. And we were all close to one another. No one wearing a mask. South Dakota, Midwest, but the, the priest was beaming that he could see us all together because for so many months beforehand, there were, there were wisps of faces during the chants, wisps. Now there was, now the grain had returned under the golden light, but these children were sitting at his feet and he was saying to them, he didn't pull any punches. Do you know how we recognize Pentecost? What are the persons involved? What is its expression? He didn't say those last two points, but <laughs> he said, well, first of all, and this relates to what you had said about the Tower of Babel, Pentecost is not only a commentary on the Tower of Babel, but it is a certain kind of fulfillment in epoch. It is a fulfillment in epoch. So the Tower of Babel crushed, languages were scattered. Scatterplot theory of history. We all know that we matter, whether I'm in India, Venezuela, Russia, America. We do have that sense of infinite self-evident worth. But the bearing straight of how to express that and fulfill our embrace of the person at the end of history is too big for us individually, and we know it. And we find ourselves in echo chambers of our own nationality, of our own ideology, which we cannot stamp out completely. How do we make all the pieces align fit, to use your language? We obviously cannot do it from within. No matter where we happen to stand, in, stand as privileged on the face of the earth. This is the same problem put in religious term, terminology that we've been going back and forth on this entire time. Pentecost, as he was speaking to these children, he said, we recognize it as having occurred because these persons heard the commotion, the noise, the disorder surround them. In other words, they, are, they were having an experience of all history prior to. No, they were hearing the wind. Yeah, they were hearing the wind. But you have to hear it as the literary expression of this whole thing we're going after of what is history. And how do we pick out of history the thing that will make us mattering to the person at the end of it? So they heard the Holy Spirit come upon them as a rushing wind, the Tower of Babel, when all the languages were separated, that was commotion, noise, chaos. So the Holy Spirit came back as the noise, the commotion. They were put right back in the front seat of the epoch of the destruction of the love that united them. But that wasn't all. Otherwise, that would just be the Tower of Babel again. They also were given little that flame, he said, above, the, above their heads. Flame is an expression. Here, the priest interpreted it for the children as the energy of the spirit. As heat comes from fire to energize the hand without going inside the hand, without informing the hand, without making the hand identifiable to the flame, without obliterating us into pure spirit, it gives us the heat, which is inside it. And the energy, which is this kind of conduct, conduction, 
of the Holy Spirit as its commotion around us, as they were hearing the wind, flame was above them. They were being given the energy of not any spirit in the midst of that chaos, but the Holy Spirit, the spirit outside the system of systems, the spirit outside of all the commotion. The commotion is the world, all the nations. They heard that. They were in the middle of that. But the reason they were at the eye of the storm and not in one of its peripheries was they were also given the energy of the Holy Spirit, which was outside of all that. And that was a paradox of synoptic. That was like the way is the truth and the truth is the all reality. Jesus said he wouldn't leave us as orphans. <laughs> he wasn't just speaking to the air when he said that. <laughs> so he, we, we, they, the Holy Spirit came as that energy that then allowed them to be synergized, synoptically to see and to synoptically hear the audio, but then to synergize them. And what was the proof of their synergy with the Holy Spirit outside of time and space while their time and space were in corruption and in commotion? They spoke the language of whoever was hearing them. Languages came back. They were united in language love. Came back in, language came back in service of unity, right? It allowed the eye to look back up to the loving parents. Language. Okay, I got some, I got a mind blower here for you because you and I were having a, an email exchange last week where you, you were talking about um, hope and trust, love and trust, yes, love and trust. And we had begun to line up love and trust with um, trust got likened to time and love got likened to space, space and time. Now you're talking about the energy of the, the flames and of the breath of the Holy Spirit. And here's a quote from uh, one of um, Stephen Wolfram's videos on the theory of everything, when he's mm -hmm. talking about the, the causal matrix and all that stuff. At minute 45, he says, energy is communication of activity in the network through time. Okay, momentum is communication of activity in the network through space. Now, I think this might be a worthwhile topic for our next get together. Where we I would agree. About... One quick thing though, in momentum is the word moment. Remember how you had earlier said the propedeutic leads to moments? Mm -hmm. Spatial topography here. But yes, yes. So love and trust, space and time. Momentum. The propedeutic and the epoch. The propedeutic and the epoch in Pentecost. You don't have to write, I mean, we don't have to write that down, but I'm just, it, it just happened to me as a connection there too. The dual consciousness is two kinds of languages, at least. So a number of different languages receiving enlightenment and unite and being united in some kind of activity, which has to be energized from without. We must indeed talk about love and trust. Yeah, because I mean, if we go back to that thing about um, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the things hoped for being actively waiting for God's fulfillment of the faith he has in birth through the power of his love. So love is that energy that in births in us, this which will be instantiated, right? Based on the actively waiting, actively waiting for the fulfillment through faith. So I think we're getting somewhere. I'm gonna put that down for our next time together. I, I need to go, but... Um, this has been fascinating. Likewise. <laughs> As usual, you're a mind blower, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> when I listen to you, I have to I have to intently focus. Oh, I did find that verse, by the way. It's James 1, 25. I'm going to read that just because since you started out with freedom, we want to finish with freedom. Um, James 1, 25, this would be the New American Standard. 
but one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. I think that fits, that fits in with what you said about freedom at the beginning. Could not have come at a better time. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to talking to you next. Let me know when you're free. Will do. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.